Kenny, you think someone out there is just like some listener out out in the universe, right? Because this podcast is broadcast all over. Everyone knows from the USCSS podcast. Everyone um, knows, but especially me, most of all. Yes. Some someone out there is just like, when the fuck are these guys gonna get to aliens, fire and stone? I have been fucking waiting. It is my favorite comic book. When are they going to fucking get to? <laughs> well, guess what? That guy, not this fucking week. <laughs> Somebody out there is mad that they didn't get their Fire and Stone episode this week. Somebody is. And uh, to that listener, I beg you, uh, stick around. It's coming. I promise it's coming. Here's the thing. I'll give you a good compromise, uh, theoretical listener. How about uh, we talk about an alien comic this week? How does that sound as a good compromise? Yeah, a, a new, a fresh just dropped alien comic uh alien icarus number three but before we get into that kenny i gotta i gotta uh i guess i'll introduce myself we don't have designations yet we're gonna get to those at the end of the episode i so i am knife that's my it's my phantom thieves name (laughs) I sorry, my brain blanked there for a second because I was like, I have no idea where he is going with this. I've been sitting on that one for a while. I am Hallstrom. And I am Rohrbacher. This is Crew Expendable, show where we talk about aliens stuff. This week, a comic book that we have not read yet, Alien Issue 3 from Marvel Comics. The reason we didn't have an elaborate metaphor about, uh, you know, how we're going through the whole franchise is because this is part of the Icarus subseries in which, just to remind uh, all the crew, all the listeners out there, um, we are going to be reading this comic in real time, live, and have not yet read it by the time we started recording. That's why we don't have a good metaphor for how we're going through this franchise we don't yet know the contents of this comic just a couple of boys out in space on the USCSS podcast formerly the sulaco uh reading comic books that's, that's the, right that's the metaphor perfect i love it we'll come up with a new one by the end maybe we sure will all right you want to jump into this comic book yeah we probably should that's why we're here after all do you want to give a little rundown of uh issues one and two what we've seen so far in this storyline I'll be glad to. All right, let's see if I can remember everything that's important. Sure. So just tag me in if you need backup. You got it. Uh, we start off beginning of issue one. We're on a planet. What's that planet's name? Uh, that was Europa Five, I believe. Okay, Europa Five was a uh, secret, hidden away planet yeah. um, owned by Wayland Utani. That was used to do like illegal R and D. Sorry, I fucked you up. Europa Five is where the Steel Team was. Uh, t- uh, okay. to- Tobler Nine. Tobler Nine is the planet we're talking about, not Europa Five. We're not to Europa Five yet. So Tobler Nine is this planet owned by Wayland Utani, and uh, they use it to basically perform illegal experiments and R and D, and like you know, investors decide what the rules and laws yeah. on the planet are and everything. And uh, because it's an alien story and it has to happen literally every single time, there is a xenomorph outbreak and everyone on the planet dies. Yep. Smash cut to uh, Europa 5. Yes. And there's a whole bunch of, well, not a whole bunch of, there's five androids that are just living a life Mm. of luxury and relaxation when they are attacked by members of uh, some military. What military was it? I believe the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army. Also, just Uh, uh, let's be clear, they prefer the term artificial human. (laughs) They sure do. <laughs> um, so there are five artificial humans get attacked by Lieutenant General George March of the U.S. Army, mm-hmm. um, who has come in to hire these five androids who were collectively known as Steel Team when they were in the Army to hire them for capital letters one last job. Hell yeah. And uh, that job is that they have to go in to the now... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, dead and lifeless Tobler 9 and make their way through a whole swarm of xenomorphs so that they can find what I believe turns out to be a genetically modified ovomorph. Yes. And the army needs that 
because they need like certain enzymes or whatever from this ovomorph to be able to boost everybody's uh like radiation defense because on some farming planet there was some big nuclear explosion and it irradiated all the crops and if they don't fix it a whole bunch of people will die yes uh that farming planet is perseus 9 perseus 9 there we go so george march uh manages to successfully convince them to agree to this one last job so they go to tobler 9 they manage to make it underground to the vault where the ovomorph is and the ovomorph is gone yep. and then while they're leaving trying to figure out their next move they get attacked by a huge swarm of xenos and since they're synths uh, one of them even gets ran through the chest but doesn't die. Yeah, dude. And then they get saved at the last moment by Gasp. Turns out there's still some living, alive humans on the planet. Yeah, a bunch of Mad Max extras show up to... Uh, that is correct. ...to help them out. Call them skin jobs or something. Well, that's something. No, that's from Blade Runner. They call them something similar to that. Skin skin bags. Yeah, I, milk, I don't remember. Milk, milk duds. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. Uh, the guy says something like, like, holy piss, it's robots or something like that. And while we're talking about what happened in the first two episodes, we already established before we started recording, I did not remember. So, Neil, can you tell us who the main characters of this comic are? Sure. The Steel Team is made up of five members. There is Freya, the de facto leader. She's a real badass Lara Croft type. We've got Eli. Um, mm -hmm. He is uh, kind of like grumpy and sort of cynical, I guess. Mm -hmm. Then there's Seth. I don't know much about Nora, who I think is the one obsessed with architecture. And I believe she is. And Astrid, who is the one with the swords. <laughs> I believe she is the redhead, if I recall. Nora or Astrid? Astrid. Okay. Then Nora is the one with the swords, and Astrid is the okay. one, I believe, isn't into architecture. It doesn't matter. I mean, they. That You're was, right. It doesn't. <laughs> it does. It doesn't matter. But that's our steel team. It, it was a very brief attempt at characterization yes. that made such a little impact. Both of us have already forgotten it. So. Yes, and they are. I, I think we should point out that it is uh, for anyone who has not read the comic. They are ethnically diverse synthetics. Mm -hmm. Which think about what we've seen in the movies, right? Specifically the movies. Mm -hmm. If we call the if we call the the five, the I guess. The, the big four plus Walter, right? Because he's mm -hmm. just a duplicate. It's all been white people, mm -hmm. right? Ash, uh, Bishop, Call, and David. Uh, one woman, mm -hmm. three men, and then Walter also is just a David. Mm -hmm. uh, he looks like David. So, but the but the Steel Team is diverse. I believe I want to say Freya is depicted as being Latinx, right? Mm -hmm. Eli is, sure is a black man, and Nora is is Asian. Yeah, she's coded as Asian. Yes. Yes. So we got a pretty diverse team here, and that is something that I don't think I've seen really in anything else. Like even the yeah, I'm, even I'm, the synthetic in um, what, what was the guy? Who's the guy in uh, Fire and Stone? Uh, didn't his name start with an E? It did. I don't remember specific. You have a list. Why don't you look at the dang list? <laughs> I'm trying to bring it up right now, actually. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, uh, I I was even sitting here trying to remember, like, if he was, you know, designed to look like a certain ethnicity, and I truly don't even remember. Yeah, uh, I remember I put it in the wrong Google Docs account. Cool, great work. <laughs> well, I've been busy. Clearly. <laughs> All right, that's the crew expendable. That's our... Hold on. Yeah, I put it in the MK Podcast one by mistake. That'll do it. You know what? While I'm in here, we we got to add these. I haven't added these people. Well, first off, you got a name for us? No, I have no idea where this file is. Well, unfortunately, I don't remember what his name is, although I just realized that I think I still probably have my notes saved from that episode. And I truly don't even know why we're bothering to do this because it does not matter fucking at all. Yeah, we should um, maybe we should let people know this is a late night recording. <laughs> it it sure is. And we're about to read a comic book. I got it right here. His name is Elden. Elden. Okay. Right. Elden Ring, of course. Yeah, l like the ring. Yes, uh -huh. that is correct. All right. I don't remember what he looks like. But in any case, I like <laughs> that that we're not just seeing a bunch of like pasty white dudes. Not that I would have minded necessarily if this was a team of like five 
Michael Fassbenders, you know. That's because you have a personally. fixation on Michael Fassbender. Sure, but like I, I do appreciate the, you know, I, I like seeing more synthetics, more types of synthetics, and especially these badass military ones too, you know. Yeah, they are pretty cool, not going to yeah. lie. I will find the list, and I will get Freya, Eli, Seth, Nora, and Astrid on the list. Uh, clearly not following the alphabet rules, but that's okay. I also have to add it's the fun. guy from Isolation to it. Um, uh, uh, Samuels. Dr. Robot. Samuels. <laughs> His name is Samuels. Samuels, okay. As a reminder to everyone, this comic book is written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Julius Ota, colors by Yen Nitro, Letters by Clayton Cowles, covers by Bjorn Berens, with variant covers by Iban Coelho and Alejandro Sanchez, John Boy Myers, and Lucio Perillo. Perillo? I'm so bad with stuff like that, and it makes me look like an idiot every time. Yeah, I don't know either. Listen, I'm just a I'm just a dumb white guy. Who fucking knows? Listeners write in and tell me how badly I butchered these names. I want to tackle one thing before we jump into the book prior, because I'm on the credits page, which is a few pages in. Don't worry, I didn't spoil it for me. On mm -hmm. the title page, you know, that gives the artist credits and the summary of what happened in the alien universe up to this point, there's a little extraction briefing box up in the corner Extraction briefing for the U.S. Steel Team. It is a description of the Ovomorph, quote, egg. All right. First discovered by Executive Officer Gilbert Ward Thomas Kane in the cargo hold of a derelict alien ship on LV-426 in 2122. So we got Kane's full name here. I never knew that was his name before. I did not know his name was Gilbert Ward, but I had heard his first name was Thomas. According to this, however, it isn't. So, you know, yeah, who knows? It's a, that's in quotes. I wonder if there's something in canon where he, he was given a different name at some point, And this is how they're clearing that up. Yeah, I don't know. It says that this is believed to be the initial stage of the xenomorph, which is a really interesting idea. Do you think there's something? I mean, this is a classic what came first, the xenomorph or the egg situation, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like the thing that came before the egg is uh, the queen. So... <laughs> I guess, but where did the queen in the come life, from? Like in the life cycle. So yeah, sure. I don't know. I mean, I would, I would agree with them. I would describe the ovomorph as the first stage of the xenomorph life cycle. Yes, right. I like that they're that this little official dossier is like believed to be. It's a, almost as if they're like we're not a hundred percent sure. There was some shit with some black goo in one of the movies, and we we haven't really worked all of that out yet. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was just the only interesting note I picked out in Kane's name and then this believed to be. Everything else is what you know about the the Ovomorph meter, one meter in height, leathery, petal like lips at the top, internal structure, much like a reptile's egg, mm -hmm. a yolk sac to support life. Fucking gross. But also kind of want to cook up like a Xeno, like an Ovo omelet. <laughs> I would not recommend that. It would probably taste <laughs> gross as hell. It probably burn like a hole through the pan and then through my body as I ate it. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. They say if you encounter one, put it in stasis immediately. General Ovomorph facts, right? Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. But Kenny, let's dive into this issue. Let's take a look at this cover. We touched on it briefly last time. This is a badass woman holding a child. And a pulse rifle. And the mm -hmm. child looks like they're holding, I don't know what they're holding. Yeah, I don't know what that is either, honestly. I can't really tell. Like a gear pack or something, probably, by the handle. And she's... Yeah, it, it's something vaguely like that. Yeah, it gotta be. And she's dressed up. Uh, she's pretty stylish looking. The kid has, like, Mad Max goggles on. And then there's some dead Xenos on the floor. I really, again, love the main covers for this series. The alternate covers also online look very, very fucking cool. I will say, though, I like this cover less than the other two we've seen so far. It's still, like, done well, but, like, the little details on the characters, yeah. like, the like the like especially the faces, look a little bit uncanny valley to me in a way that the other two covers so far have not. Okay. I can but, see that. But, I mean, that. it's... It, it's still a good cover, and I still do like it. It's just, of the three covers so far, it is probably my least favorite one. So I can, I'm can i looking at the cover for issue two now, and I can confirm on issue three's cover, this is Freya, because dress, okay. she's dressed the same as Freya was on the cover of issue two when she's standing by Eli. I, I totally Fair see enough. what you're saying. 
Um, this is a real smoky room that they're in on this cover. And she looks like she's got like some shit on her face. Yeah. It, it's, it's, she's got like milky blood on her face almost. I think that's what's kind of messing it up. Yeah. It like, I mean, she's probably bleeding then in that case, because since this is Freya, you know, right. But, uh, but yeah, I just, I, there's something about it. Like, you know, the rest of it, like the bodies, the backgrounds, the xenomorph, like everything else looks fine, but like specifically the faces of the two characters just look very slightly off to me in a way that the other faces of the other characters from the previous two covers didn't. Right. Okay, that's fair. But yeah, otherwise it's cool though. She's standing there, badass pose, big, you know, holding out a big like yeah. pulse rifle or flamethrower or something yeah. in one hand and it's smoking at the end. I mean, overall, it's a very cool image, you know? It is. It's it's Ripley with Newt, right, at the end of Aliens yeah. in a lot of ways. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, with better or worse fashion. <laughs> it, it's kind of both uh, <laughs> yeah depending on how much you liked the fashion and aliens i suppose <laughs> yeah i loved it but i also love this so you know well let's get into it then all right listeners follow along <laughs> kenny's gonna read the whole thing to you yeah the issue is already out so you absolutely can read along with us while we're talking about it yeah so we're gonna uh, definitely open still on tobler nine there's a storm yeah, yeah. and i don't know if it's the art I guess we'll find out in a minute here. It almost looks like acidic rain. It's like black rain almost. And I can't tell if this is a stylistic choice or not. It almost looks like it's raining black goo. It's raining path. <laughs> it's raining pathogen. That's yeah. pretty fun. It, it almost looks like that. They're yeah. going to fucking mutate like Eldon did in Fire and Stone. <laughs> what if that's the twist? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, that would be a pretty cool twist. I'd be fine with it. And that's how they pull fire and stone into the Marvel canon. But uh, yeah, there's a big storm that starts and it's raining and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least eight people marching along. Yeah. And uh, uh, presumably one of the humans calls, uh, I believe it's Nora, a gearhead. Gearhead. That's what they call it. They said, holy piss is gearheads. That's what they said at the end of the last issue. Oh, and then yeah. we, it says it says right here that the rain is radioactive, so that's yeah. fun. Yeah, and the, the um, human, as far as we know, the human rescuer says, better sick than dead. The storms wash away our trail and make it harder for the monsters to track us. Nice. Oh, as they're walking along, they're very clearly being followed by a xenomorph. But then they turn around and use some kind of net gun to pin the xenomorph to the wall Hell and then yeah. just fill it full of holes until it's dead. Damn, that's like Predator tech. And then one of them, two of them actually, pull out a big knife and start carving uh parts of the xenomorph off as trophies starting with the uh second pharyngeal jaw mouth so that's fun hell yeah nice to see humans who accept that they're just animals okay that's cool i like that all right so it looks to me like this is seth who got impaled not eli in this artwork so i said eli and i was mistaken so we're going back and uh, officially retconning what we said earlier. Yeah, settled. Seth is the one who's in a relationship, which is a very fun, fun idea with uh I think Nora. that's Nora. Right. Because yeah. she's like, hang in there, mm -hmm. baby. How you doing? Uh, let's see. Uh, Nora gets mad because Seth is starting to not shut down, but like, you know, get injured, so to speak. But turns out they're already there. Where are yeah. they going? Um, Some secure facility with a bunch of human survivors. On behalf of the board of trillionaire despots, all the corpses in the Department of Tourism and Investment and the whole family at Wayland Utani. They're at the former Capital Utilities and Maintenance Complex, is apparently where these humans hang out. And when they walk in, there's a whole bunch of other humans. And they're all set up, and they look like they have some kind of maybe uh, miniature farming setups. And there's a whole bunch of uh, what looks like, I believe, to be flamethrowers trained on the door as they walk in. What's with this guy, the guy who lets them in? He's the weaselly one who call him gearheads, right? I believe so, yeah. yeah he describes this underground facility this where they all, he says, where the lucky ones wait to die. So he's clearly like a, like a nihilist, right? 
and uh, let's see, when Steel Team comes in, one of the humans immediately recognizes them and uh, knows who they are and what they did. Yeah, this person says that the, the, you're the Steel Team. You're synthetic, synthetic special forces, the killer robots the U.S. used to sick on our defense units. And that, per, uh, like that lady turns out her name is Melody, and she is the leader of the yeah. living humans. And she's not too happy about them being here, is she? Uh, she clearly doesn't seem to be, no. Here, they do call them milk. She calls them milkmen. Look at that. That's fucking great, <laughs> dude. <laughs> she hates synthetics. She really yeah. does. That's that's going to be fun. She looks like a badass. She got daggers strapped. She looks like a D&D &D character. She looks like kind of like my D&D &D character. She has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine weapons on her that yeah. I can see, as well as a flask on her hip. <laughs> yeah, it's. Pro I mean, it's, that canteen is probably full of water, but I think it's probably a little bit of little bit of booze in there you know and then they uh, lay down seth so they can start working on him and uh i i want to i want to dive into this because he says check my data receptors connection to the h cell please i don't know man i like this first of all absolutely love that he and nora are like an item i don't know why i mean it's really making these synths feel more human right but like they're not it's not like walter who is just like was totally agreeable like you know i love walter we all love walter right mm -hmm. who's just like agreeable to a fault and then uh david obviously with this like twisted sense of like feeling and emotion and love and all of that kind of stuff and then you've got i know call was pretty realistic in her mannerisms and she was supposed to be like a synthetic built by other synthetics to be more mm -hmm. human so it really feels like the steel team is in that league of synthetics you know They've got like genuine emotions, but it's not, it's not like in a weird David way. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just like it. But then I also like him then talking about the data receptors connection to his H cell. <laughs> like, so let's settle down, buddy. Like there's people around, you know, save that for the bedroom. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, while they're working on Seth, uh, Freya notices a little kid uh, staring at her. And hey. uh, this kid has a gas mask around its neck and a big pair of goggles on its forehead and is wearing a hood. No. So to me, it is clear that this is the child from the That's, cover. Yeah, she meets the kid from the cover. I bet they're going to get along. Uh, she introduces herself to him and uh, we find out that he is deaf. Luckily, she knows Terran standard sign. And so the two of them are talking a little bit, and he seems very enthusiastic about it. But uh, okay, I... Eli chastises her for trying to, quote, collect pets on the job. <laughs> yeah, fucking Eli. I like the way the bubbles are for when she's speaking in sign language, that they're yeah, it's, circles it, around it's... her hands with the speech bubbles. Yeah, they're written like speech bubbles, but like the speech line goes to a circle around her hand rather than her head. That's yeah. really cool. I like that. Um, don't collect any pets on this job, Freya. Come on. Freya's in charge, dude. You need to chill out. And then we once again have somebody confirm that Eli is mistrustful of organics. Right. Oh, and finally, we had a question last uh, Icarus episode about who these people even were. Well, right. luckily, Freya says, who are these people? Yes. And I so I predicted that they were going to be I believe I predicted that they were going to be like the R&D department. Right. Yeah. They're going to be the pub. And what is and what does uh, Melody say here? Well, Melody directly says, I was in R&D, but Called she goes it. on to say that most of the people were, you know, salesmen, cooks, janitors, things yeah. like that. So the ones who are quicker than their mates. So she must be Australian when the aliens came. <laughs> most of them stay in hibernation. Most of the aliens stay in hibernation until they get too close. They're ready to move and they have other bunkers just in case they need to move quick. Yeah, we get a nice panel of what looks like a a, a woman, like a, maybe a teacher teaching children. They've all got books and and right behind the kids, like sitting on this blanket in 
front of this teacher, you know, crisscross applesauce style with their books. So there's then harpoons and spears on the wall behind them, yeah. like weapons everywhere, which uh, and, uh, that's, a, that's a nice detail because they're like, yeah, if we have to have weapons everywhere in case xenomorphs get in here. Yep. Yeah. Melody says that the kids think that steel team was sent by the company to rescue them but uh when freya says well i mean we could if you want us to melody's like we don't we know the company doesn't fucking give a shit about us yeah she's read an alien comic before <laughs> Melody, then, melody's uh, like look i've seen the movies okay i know the company doesn't care about <laughs> us and then Eli uh, finds one of the humans uh, going through their bags that they left just outside the complex. Yeah, her name her name is Lee. She didn't find anything useful because because they're humans and these guys are synthetics. And she immediately wonders if he is able to have sex with her. So that's fun. Yeah. Whoa. Settle down. She's like, can I check out the the receptor for your H cell? Uh, <laughs> for, for the listeners, specifically what she says is, are you the kind of gearhead that has all of a man's parts or are you the other kind? She's like, I was just thinking what use is a walking power tool might have. Damn, dude. And then, and then Eli's um, like, I have a giant penis. <laughs> he says it. it's in then, the book. You uh, can read it. Then he uh, accuses her of taking something from the bag. Yeah. And then he sees a weird looking bug crawling across the scarf wrapped around her neck. Yes. And then he immediately is like, actually, you know what? Never mind. Forget I said anything. Do you remember when um in issue two, because that's one thing we didn't touch on in the summary. I didn't remember it until just this moment when they get into the lab and find the, or the ovomorph is gone. They instead find all of these like insects that don't resemble the insects they're labeled as. And, we deduce that they must have been pathogen experiments, right? Because there are all those, also all of those pathogen jars in the lab yep, as well. That sure, that sure did happen, and I also completely forgot it happened until just right now. So yes. this is one of the spec. <laughs> so this is one of the specimens got loose, and it's on her. And he's like, he doesn't like human beings, so he's like, "Fuck it, I don't care. You're all gonna die anyway, right?" I mean, he doesn't say that, but I think that's what he's thinking. You know? Yeah. He sees that. He sees that creature, that weird looking fly, crawling on her, and he's like, "Eh." Doesn't matter. Never. Yeah, never mind. And then we cut back to Freya and Melody talking. Freya is explaining why they're here. She tells her tells her a little bit about, you know, the quote, agro complex is the word they use. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the biologic was the word we were talking about. Right. And, you know, explains why they're here. So on and so forth. Um, Melody says that none of them have radiation sickness. All the buildings that held it were turned to glass when the bombs fell. That's yeah. fun. And then Melody directly accuses Freya. You're here for the sample. You want the egg. And Damn. Freya has a look on her face like, yeah, you got me. She says, do you even know where it is? Melody says, where it is, it's everywhere. Because apparently that egg hatched years and years ago. And they are now, the descendants of that ovomorph are the dominant strain, alien strain on the planet. So yeah. after the fact, we named it the Icarus strain. There's where the title comes from, dude. Well, actually, I mean, it doesn't explain the title, but that's where the that's where the story yeah, that, title that is from. why the comic right. is called icarus if i yes. know shortage of eggs now but getting them's another matter so that's pretty fascinating this is a good twist i didn't see that coming at all neither right? did i because we we predicted that these people had gotten the biologic and she's straight up yeah. saying no and then uh freya says that if you help us get one of the eggs we will take every human on this planet with us and uh melody's like you better you know what? Fine. Yeah, we'll do it when the next storm hits. They're going out, and it's two days later, and it is either storming again or okay. storming still. She, well, she did say when the next storm hits, so this must be a new storm. Uh, that's true. You but got our, me there. Good our, point. Our steel team's got some pretty fancy new gear on, don't they? They sure do. They're all wearing, like, Strider Hear You capes. Oh, and uh, Eli has a fucking massive, gigantic axe. Holy shit, he back. does. And <laughs> the, the blade of the axe is as big as his torso. Astrid, Astrid's got a bow and arrow, right? Mm -hmm. 
She's it looks like she's got some kind of axe wrapped as well. But this, maybe that's the arrows that she's got them covered from the acid rain. I like these and little then, like cl- yeah. cloak things they have on. I don't. I. It looks cool. I don't understand the purpose. It's not covering enough of them to protect them from the acid rain. But and they're synthetic, so they don't really need it anyway. <laughs> but it does look rad. This is a great. It does look cool. Yes. This is going to be the thumbnail art. <laughs> Something with this look is going to be the thumbnail art for the episode. Um, and then Melody points out the uh, rail station that has now been, the old rail right. station that has now been converted to a nest by Xenos. Yeah. And that's where, that was like page two of issue one. We saw the people trying to get on the train. So that's probably and, that exact location. Um, she says the part of the reason there's a problem is because there is a big old queen living down there. Oh, shit. Um, a big one. So yeah, her chamber is where the eggs will be, and you're gonna have to kill her to be able to get one of the eggs out. Um, and then we find out what the deal is about the Icarus strain and why that yeah. specific why that specific Hold thing on. is relevant. I want to touch on one thing here. When she's describing okay. the queen, she says, uh, "Every time we kill one of her drones, the whole nest goes mad looking for us." They've gotten too close a few times. So I, this is again, something back to our, the topic of conversation during our aliens podcast about like the hive mind and everything. Yeah, I, I, I will. I mean, yes, that is further evidence for it, but I will also say that's kind of the reason why I glossed over that part because that isn't really any new information that we didn't know I know, I know I'm not like, I'm not like breaking like. I'm not like yeah. breaking this news to anyone. This hive mind thing is pretty, it's not a controversial subject in the topic of aliens, yeah. but just but yes, as a reminder, does confirm it. Yes. Well, it more like it was, I think I spoke on that episode that it wasn't even something that I had really thought too hard about for a long time. Yeah. Like this, like I think, okay, hive mind, but I don't think about them having specific, like outside of aliens, having like specific motivations and like this idea of like vengeance and revenge and stuff like that. Right. Like higher brain function. Yeah. Yeah, It always just felt like they were just programmed to kill, not like, okay, you killed one of ours. You put one of ours in the hospital. We're putting one of yours in the morgue kind of deal, you know, (laughs) like, I don't know. I just, yeah, that's just me. That's just me. Anyway. There's uh, about a page here where Freya and Melody are talking about what specifically makes the Icarus strain different from other, you know, versions. Yeah. And they basically say that uh, what makes them special is that the Icarus strain is basically a form of selective xenomorph breeding to basically make their better or their good qualities better while eliminating their bad qualities. So they're like, even though, you know, as the first movie told us, they're the perfect organism, the Icarus strain was an attempt to make them even more perfect. Right. Yeah. They were carefully selecting hosts based on prerequisite strengths and immunities. So human hosts, they're like, let's take the healthiest people we can find and expose them and birth super healthy xenomorphs out of super healthy humans. And that is ultimately the reason why, um, like, you know, when March said, oh, you need to go get that ovomorph that has that specific biologic in it that will help us. Well, turns out um, every ovomorph from the Icarus strain has those qualities and every xenomorph on this planet is part of the Icarus strain. So it's, it's pretty basic, cool. It's they don't need to find an ovomorph. They just need to find any one of yeah. them from anywhere because all of them will work. Right. Eventually. This is a fascinating twist. I don't know if twist yeah. is the right word, but it's it what a cool concept of like no, we were we were like I mean we've seen things about xenomorph experiments in other stuff, right? Um, yeah. once again, it was a big topic of alien infiltrator, right? The prequel mm-hmm. novel to, to, uh, say it, say yeah, it, fire team elite. Yeah. 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 Fire team. Go. But also like, I remember, I think it was cold forge. They were doing like, they were using primates as test subjects. So we've seen them do a lot of stuff with test subjects, but nothing this specific, like, yeah. no, this was the, the goal was to basically what they're doing 
is taking human DNA and then filtering it through the xenomorph to enhance it and then put it back into humans as the biologic to make humans stronger. Pretty much what Melody uh, implies here when she says there's too much of us in them. Yeah. Basically, what they were doing here was cutting d human DNA directly into xenomorphs. Right. Making them more humanoid, i.e. smarter. <laughs> Right, something David could only dream of doing. Because she even goes on to say that they're a bit cleverer and more patient. Right. Uh, some of them even have the capacity to be cruel in a way that mindless animals can't. Yeah, it feels like they're trying to lure in the rest of us, which we've seen them do that before, too. Right, so this is where, so this is why... It's called the Icarus strain, right? Because essentially yeah. through these experiments, they figuratively flew too close to the sun and it ended Presumably, up... Presumably, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, this is about the hubris of the scientists and Wayland yutani Like, think that they were untouchable and what they were doing was yeah. so great and beneficial and then it ended up burning them. And then uh, while they're walking along... Uh, Lee kind of stumbles and bumps into someone and then she is really looking like shit. She is looking sick as hell right now. So presumably she probably got bitten by that bug earlier, if I had to guess. Yeah, um, getting, getting and covenant flashbacks, right? They uh, pull out their weapons and that's good because behind them from the water a whole bunch of xenomorphs stand up and start to attack them yes so uh there's a big firefight and they're all running towards this big huge portcullis because they're in like you know ankle or knee deep water right now yeah and dude. so they're running towards this big portcullis and this is uh, that scene from aliens like it ramped up yeah you know yeah pretty much i want to back i want to go back a page What's okay. the deal with the shoes, the bloody shoes hanging from the ceiling in this hive? Oh, um, a little bit earlier on, Melody, when she was talking about how, like, cruel they can be, she mentions that sometimes they'll, like, leave parts of their victims <laughs> behind just to taunt the humans. <laughs> so... And while she's saying that, we God see a sh we see a bloody shoe hanging from the yeah. ceiling, indicating that that's clearly one of them. So They'll kill to eat or protect their young, the right to mate, maybe. Never for a laugh. Interesting. It's cool, though. This is a good book. I'm enjoying yeah. this. And this artwork in the water with the Xenos chasing them, the shootout, uh the bow and arrow attack the this is very very fun to look at honestly yeah 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 the artwork is great freya gives some kind of monologue to everyone while uh they're fighting all of these xenomorphs yeah. and you know basically propping them up you know we're steel team we'll win like we always have that kind of stuff yeah. and um as they're uh, fighting off the xenomorphs, Freya turns around and notices that the five synths are the only ones there, and all of the humans have already fled to the other side of the portcullis, yeah. and Melody drops the chain, closing off that passageway right in front of them while they're about to dive underneath it. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, all the humans are on the other side of the portcullis, leaving the five members of Steel Team out in the open to fight the Xenomorphs by themselves. And then when Astrid says, what just happened? Eli goes, what always fucking happens? They screwed us. Yeah. Melody's, I can't get an egg. I can't let an egg get off world, Freya, not for any reason. Freya's shouting at her, we're trying to save human lives. Millions will die if you do this. And then Melody has a line that, like, I read it and I was like, you know, fair enough. She says, if anyone's last hope lies with these monsters, they're dead already. And, you yeah. know, can't argue with that. <laughs> You'll doom them the way we doomed ourselves. Sorry, milkman. Your friend wasn't right. You never should have come here. And the reason they should have never come here is because... The queen showed up. And you never should have trusted us. Hell yeah. 
and the, uh, for, for the record, uh, listeners, uh, that is how the issue ends. The final panel is a full page panel of the queen showing up. Yeah. And I should specify this queen is gigantic. Is a like, big if we queen. As, like if we assume a standard xenomorph is like, you know, seven or eight feet tall, uh, this queen is probably, if I had to guess, maybe 20 feet tall. Yeah. Something like that. I, I this just queen is big as hell. I just flipped back to where we where um, Melody was talking about the the special ovo. It doesn't look like a royal face hugger to me, and the mm-hmm. chest burster doesn't. Not as far as I'm aware. It looks like it might have some arms down there though that aren't. Fully I out I yet. believe I believe royal face huggers have webbed legs. I think. Yeah, they look a little different. I guess we'll see one in Alien Three. In yeah, a, in th- a this one here. very. Cl- yeah, this face hugger here very clearly does not have webbed limbs, so that presumably is not the queen. I guess we're just generically seeing a takeover of somebody. Sure, or we not are... Not necessarily... Like, I don't think we're intending to be seeing, like, how the colony started. I think we're just seeing a specific glimpse of just someone getting taken. Yeah, I guess. I don't I'm not going to sweat it too much. We could also have maybe an egg morphing situation on our hands, right? Maybe uh the drone from this grab someone and turn them into an egg. I don't know. I don't know, man. Not going to question so, it too uh, much. This this um this was good. I I'm real I'm sorry. I'm just looking through this action set again. Uh mm-hmm. there's a lot of cool details in this. First of all, I love the the way the aliens look in this, the way the Xenos look in this. This is good. Like the close-ups of their faces with the jaws distended and stuff, and how it's kind of like dripping slime all over everything. Yeah, you yeah, love it. It's really you love, you love to fucking see it. Really though. good. And then there's like this like body strewn up on the page before it, and it's like missing its legs, missing its yeah. legs. And I wonder if those are like they just took the whole leg off when they wanted to get the shoes. You know? Yeah, just but a yeah. really. I uh, this is I just should. Good. I, I should take a moment to point out, though, that as far as I can tell, I believe uh, the scene on the cover never actually happens in the book. No, it hasn't because happened. I, because Certainly not yet. As, as far as I know, um, I don't think that child even came with them on this trip. No. And uh, when Freya was interacting with the child, not only did she never pick him up, but she was not holding a pulse rifle at the time. Right. But I think the, I think it was specifically like Bjorn Berens was like, I'm going to do a reference to Ripley and yeah. Newt, just a stylistic, just a, an homage essentially with that. I'm looking at our party charging through the water here. This is a fucking D and D adventure party, isn't it? This is a D and D. This is an alien D and D campaign. It sure is. Baby. It's what this whole book is. Yeah, because we've got someone with a bow, uh, someone with a big rifle, someone with a smaller rifle, uh, someone with a flamethrower, and Nora even has a crossbow. Yeah, dude. And then the big, don't forget the big giant axe, right? The big giant axe, that's correct. And they all have big yeah. cloaks on. Yeah. I mean, this is a and d party right here. That it's, is correct. It's awesome. I am, this is, I don't know how this is going to stand. Okay, well, let's just get to opinions, right? This is this book is good. I think this book is this issue is really good. So far, this is one of my favorite alien experiences, like in terms of just fun. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's not terrifying me the way Alien did, um, but I but this is like I'm excited. I'm invested. It looks good. This is maybe the second best looking alien comic I've read next to James Stokoe's Dead Orbit. Mm-hmm. But that guy is just on a he's just on his own level when it comes to art and everything. I'm not going to lie, man. Yeah. Uh, there was a period. I mean, I suppose I could do this off air because this isn't yeah. really something the listeners specifically need to know about. But there was a period uh, a little while ago, some weeks ago, not more than a couple of months ago, though, where we were trying to decide what we wanted to cover next. And I was seriously considering saying, fuck it. Why don't we just cover Dead Orbit? I know it's not chronologically the next thing, but like that comic rules we should just do an episode about it but then but then we figured out something to do so i never bothered bringing it up but yeah i almost suggested we did it a few weeks ago so i mean stoko's just great he did a great 
uh, Godzilla series, the half century war, his, his book orc stain is incredible. Um, yeah, there's, there's two alien comics that I really, really want to get to. I mean, well, I should say three technically because I'm really, really looking forward to the back half of this run. Yeah. Yeah, but they're the two comics that I really, really am looking forward to talking about are Dead Orbit and Salvation, the one done by Mike Mignola. Yeah, we got that's on the list too. But anyway, we're not here to talk about those yet. We will sooner or later. We're here to talk about Alien Icarus number three, baby. You were talking about how much you liked it. Yeah, it it's great. This is really fun. The story's moving over these three issues. The story is moving at a good pace for me. Nothing is nothing is dragging, right? Uh, everything is compelling. I think the characters are uh, okay. I'm getting a little tired of Eli and his "I hate the meat bags" stuff, and then same. The, but you, like on the one hand, I totally understand it because these the Steel Team has been exploited by humans and also looked down on by humans. Let's not forget that the reason they're doing this is to get citizenship. You know, and see, here's the thing. Yes, I do agree with you. Like, that is true. On right. the other hand, I understand I'm reading a comic book. And so by this point, I'm like, this is the third issue. I fucking get it. Right. I didn't forget that this is one of his personality traits. You don't one, need I'm to so... re... Yeah, you yeah. don't need to re-remind me every single time the guy is on screen. Right. I didn't forget he has these opinions. The issue Just, isn't yeah. that it's... <laughs> one of his traits the issue is that it's his only trait so far it is the okay, only yes, trait that enough. he's had fair enough yes you know, also well that and the fact that he prefers the big weapons that do a lot of damage he's the one with right. the big axe you know and yeah i i believe he's the one that ripped off a praetorian's head with his bare hands yes. in the second issue he's like he's like yeah, he's he's the barbarian of the group, pretty much. Hundred percent, he is. But yeah. I want a little. I I want him to get it fleshed out a little bit more because he's. I mean, if Frey is number one on this team, he's number two, right? I mean, like, he certainly. I mean, he certainly has seems to be having more screen time and more like appearance in dialogue conversations yes than everyone other than freya is yeah right. so to me it seems like he is clearly number two on the team but he's got i'm sure there's going to be a turn for him in the next couple of issues especially considering he allowed these humans to get exposed to this yeah pathogen infected fly or whatever right all right something's well, gonna happen then in that case, I will just very quickly uh, give my review. I also think this issue was really good. The art was great, just as always. The xenomorphs looked fucking phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so one thing I didn't mention, or one thing neither of us actually mentioned over the course of the episode, is that uh, all of these humans, they were illustrated in such a way where it's very clear that they've been living a very hard life. Because especially in like yes. wider shots where you see multiple humans, you can tell that all of them are kind of gaunt and thin and like underfed and a little bit malnourished. Yeah. Like you can always see everyone's cheekbones and everything. And so it's just like it's like a nice little detail that none of the dialogue ever calls attention to. Right. And so like, you know, and the human characters, you know, they all dressed similarly. They have like, you know, like you said, the strider cloaks on and everything. <laughs> but each one of them had ways to make them visually distinct. Yes. And um, I like how Melody actually like knew the score and like was able to give them information. And like she wasn't just like trying to railroad them or trying to cut them off entirely. Like she was willing to help them, even though turns out we find out at the end she was helping them so that she could use them but like i like how she was actually like giving them information and like advancing their cause there right and yeah the art was the art was really good i will say i think i liked the previous episode or the previous issue a little bit better just because the action sequences were longer and there were more of them sure but uh 
But the, this one, th- this this issue was a nice balance of the previous two. It had more exposition than yeah. issue two and more action than issue one. So it had a nice balance of everything up so far. And so, yeah, I thought it was good. I thought it was fun as of right now. Admittedly, I have not read as many Aliens comics as you have. But as of right now, this is gearing up to be maybe my favorite alien comic so far like ever that i've read this is definitely my favorite of things we've covered on the show comic comic wise okay yes yeah that is a good point i will i will slightly retcon what i said and say yes of everything we've covered on the show when i say everything ever i should say yes that is what i mean everything so far we've talked about this is I was going to say this is probably my favorite one, but I think this is definitely my favorite one so far. Right. And we're not, and we're talking books and comics in this, I think, right? We're not talking like, a, this isn't better than Alien. It is not. No. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm referring to the ancillary material. Yes. Right. Although, to be fair, I do like this comic more than I like a couple of the movies. So, uh, agreed. Honestly, this is better than Prometheus and Covenant. And yeah. I'll give it. Yeah, I'll give w- it those two for sure. I don't think it's better than Prey. Remember when we talked about Prey? God uh, damn. Oh man, that movie was so fucking good, dog. Yeah. yeah, Prey. Oh, which reminds me. Um, again, uh, you can cut this out of the episode if you hey. want, because this isn't really a conversation we need to have oh, we for have listeners. It. Uh, do you want to cover the Marvel Predator comic? I've been thinking about that. We, I, I don't know. We might want to do some of that with the Predator Month stuff, maybe. Well, here, here, what I was thinking then, why don't, um, you know, we're doing just occasional random here and there episodes yeah. of, uh, Archie versus predator. Sure. We need to when get back we're to done. <laughs> well, tr- well, we don't need to, we can just do it whenever we feel like, but like, my point is when we get through all of those episodes, yeah. do we want to just keep doing that format, but with the predator comic instead? Yeah, I think so. I think we could talk. I haven't read any of the Marvel predator stuff, but I'd be neither down. have I. Yeah. I mean, it started a, like, I was going to say a lot later, but it started like several months after the alien comic did. Yeah. So they only have like a handful of episodes or issues out. So, but anyway, yeah, I think, yeah, I wanted um, to talk to you about that too. I think, um, I think we should in some form okay. talk about those predator books as well. We also need to talk about the first couple Marvel alien arcs pretty soon uh, we'll here. get there we'll get there sooner yeah. okay. which honestly but, like there was another like name drop in this about the uh spinner colony from the second arc yeah from uh, i believe it's revival i think it's called i think so yeah i've i've read it i don't know the title so, <laughs> but uh but anyway um we both had our reviews talked about what we liked and possibly right. didn't like about it so let me ask you neil yeah um I- yeah, I got one more thing I want to say about how, oh, okay. Go how ahead. the Go book ahead. looks. I This has been my favorite issue of the three so far. A huge part of it was just like the setting, like the, the nighttime, the acid rain, the water like trudging through, you know, all of mm-hmm. like just the vibe. Like it just looked looked really good. Like the setting really got me going here in an appropriate, in inter- an appropriate way. I just want to say... <laughs> I will interject here yeah. real quick as a way to support and agree with your theory. Yeah. I think that I think the coloring on this yes. book is phenomenal. Stunning, like the, stunning the work. color, the color work in this issue is in my opinion, the best one so far of this run. Right. And that's what made me make the Stoko reference. Cause the way he colors things is also just extremely effective. Like, yeah. Like the art in this is also very good, but the colors are doing a lot of, both are doing a lot of heavy lifting, but the colors are really like really tying, like making the artwork pop. You know, I after I finished scrolling through the issue because I'm reading this digitally after yes. I finished scrolling through the issues, I had to go back to a previous page to look at something. And I just kind of like stopped on a page to like get back into the conversation. I glanced down and the specific panel that I'm looking at right here is the panel where Freya notices there aren't any humans. Yeah. And then she turns around and Melody drops the portcullis. And that panel in the middle of the page right. where it's just like a close up on Freya's like eyes as she realizes what happens. 
everything else uh, on the page around it is like you know swathed in blue and then this one panel there's just a strip right in the middle of the page that's just this like loud bright red orange and like you know her eyes fill up the panel and like it just it it, the color really makes these panels pop really really well this is a this is a great example i mean everything so much of the environments and everything is like these cool blues and violets and purples and greens and then you get these like pops of like warm oranges like from the gunfire or whatever in this panel with with freya like you're talking about is just so just rich with color contrasting everything else on the page and it just works really really well i like i'm imagining this as like an animated alien movie yeah holy shit are you kidding me (laughs) like that would look like especially and i'm here we're going to talk about fire team a little bit more right that that game is fucking drab and dark and it's these industrial environments and it sure ru- is ruined <laughs> you know planet like engineer ruins and shit like that and it all looks very cool but then you look at something like this and it's just got so much yeah. life to it you know by yeah, comparison yeah this pops in a way other stuff doesn't yeah. right and it's, i'm just it yeah it's really really clicking for me okay all right so, Neil, let me ask you. Yes. You've had a pretty good run of this so far. So <sighs> now that you've read issue three of Icarus, I'm going to ask you, can you predict what is going to happen in issue four? You've done that the last couple of times and had a pretty good track record. So let's see if you can keep the train going. Damn, I honestly don't think I can. I don't think I was that on with this. I think I was maybe right about a few things. I mean, I could, I could probably, anyone could probably telegraph that the humans were going to betray the synthetics, right? Yep. Especially, I would say that. Especially given Melody being in R&D and so familiar with this specific strain of xenomorph DNA and everything, like she was in on this, right? So she, I get what she's doing with the, I can't let this stuff get off the planet because it'll destroy the galaxy. Like she's going already forgetting the guy's name the captain who caused the breakout in isolation the same way he was like i'm gonna crash my ship into the into sevastopol and end everything like she's not in ripley mode right she's not in rescue people mode and stop Mm -hmm. this from happening she's in like full-on like self-preservation mode melody is melody's in full self-preservation mode probably because she's got a lot of guilt for being involved in this experiment so the the thing that I didn't see coming, which maybe I should have, was the sample getting loose and apparently infecting, starting to infect the humans. So I will admit, I thought that was a nice touch because when she's like, oh, that egg hatched years ago. And I went, oh, like, because like on one hand, of course it did. But on the other hand, the last time we saw it, it was like in stasis in a glass case. Right. So, like, why would it have occurred to me that, like, it would have hatched but when there's no one around to activate it and it's in some kind of medically induced coma? Like, why would it ever occur to me that, of course, like, in, in retrospect, yeah, because that's what Omor- ovomorphs do, but, like, who was even around for that thing to hatch at to, in the first place, you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess just the scientists and the researchers. Yeah, I guess. Uh s- I can give like an overall prediction of what I think, how I think this is going to end. All right. And this is something that I don't think is going to unfold in the next issue. So do you mind if I give a prediction for how this thing wraps up? Go right ahead. I think that this whole thing wraps up with the survivors are now somehow going to be infected by, you know, pathogen in some way. And they're going to mutate mm-hmm. similar to the mutations we've seen in fire team elite um or prometheus i guess <laughs> that is correct yes. i bring up the fire team thing for just to be funny sometimes i even talk about it on the mortal Kombat show you sure did <laughs> but, <laughs> but i think so i think that that's going to start maybe not mutating them into monsters but wiping them out and they're gonna start dying some of them are probably going to mutate meanwhile xenomorphs are gonna like I think the steel team for the most part is going to survive this encounter with the queen. Mm-hmm. I think the alt- I think what we're going to get at the end is the cover of this issue. I think it's going to be Freya escaping with the child, with the boy. All right. Maybe some of the other steel team members also, but I'm not sure. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't think she's going to recover a sample. I think that there's going to be some event where they're going to decide that they have to, because of the pathogen outbreak and the xenomorph outbreak, they're going to need to steal some DNA to hopefully forge the biologic and then nuke the place. I think that that's what's going to happen. I'm guessing that, uh, I mean, I don't necessarily Ooh, wait. I got ahead. another idea, but you go first. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm still formulating uh, my idea. So. The child is the biologic. Ah. Yeah, they're gonna get a sample. They're gonna get this. They're gonna get the biologic out through a human sample, not through a xenomorph sample. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Which may be something I predicted on an earlier one, but I am gonna call it right now that it's the child. I um I think that this fight with the queen is going to end with them killing the queen and then finding uh, like you know an egg in her or in the chamber or something yeah. and then like you know they have the egg they need they try to get out and then the humans um attack them to try to stop them and then they have to uh kill the humans to be able to get out and then uh, they get back to uh, General March and give him the egg. And then the thing hatches and uh, turns everyone into xenomorphs. Okay. And so uh, March is never able to get that sample to them because all of them got killed by getting turned into a xenomorph. I can see that. So they do get like they do, you know, succeed on the mission. And then like, you know, March is like able to give them like their payment. But before he's able to synthesize or process it all, yeah. they all get turned into face hugged and turned into xenomorphs and they die. So the synths, uh, you know, succeed at their goal and become citizens. But uh, the ovomorph is not used as the biologic to do all of this stuff okay. is what I'm guessing happens at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I should mention, because we didn't talk about it, um, each of these issues have um, the cover of the next issue as the final page. And this issue is apparently called The Future of Warfare. And it's the gigantic queen uh, pinning someone up against a wall while screaming at... uh, what looks like Freya yeah. and Nora, while Freya slowly reaches towards a pulse rifle on the ground. Yeah, it looks pretty good, honestly. Yeah. Variant cover for it, I'm looking at online. It's a pretty standard, like, alien coming out of the darkness for issue mm, four. I got you. Looks good. I mean, a classic image, but one you see all the time, you know? Right, yeah. There's some other good issue three variants. The issue three variants are pretty good. I'm excited to read the rest of this. So, Neil, let me ask you. Yeah. Do you have anything else you would like to mention about this issue? I probably do, but we've been going for a while. This one's a little loosey goosey, and I think I'm I think I'm good. Um, if you're not reading this thing, go fucking read it. Right? Go like, read it. We glossed over a lot of things in the dialogue and stuff like that. I, I because that's one thing maybe we should talk about. We're not directly reading things or recounting things word for word this isn't an audiobook right i think the writing in this is very strong like not just the yeah. story concept but the dialogue is also good for the most part it's it's very good and it's yeah, worth the reading re- the reason why i've just been generalizing the events and stuff is because it is mentally kind of hard for me to be able to read something and also talk about it, but not just directly, you know, recite it. Right. It's hard for me to read something and then generalize and converse about it while I'm reading it. So I just kind of gloss over the stuff and then, you know, cover over what's the important stuff and then move on. Yeah, this, like you said, this isn't an audiobook. This isn't a word for word transcription of all right. of the events. So if our generalized plot synopsis sounded cool, maybe you should go fucking read it yourself. Yeah. Jerks. <laughs> Um, the only thing I really wanted to add is it kind of pisses me off that Eli had that big, huge, cool axe and he never used it to cut a xenomorph's head off. Right. But, uh, I got, I got, we should have seen him using it. I got a feeling that's like, that's, um, 
Chekhov's axe. That shit's going to show up. He's going to be cutting a queen's tail off with that thing next uh, I, issue, I was, dude. I was about to say, I have a <laughs> feeling he's going to be, like, cutting a queen's arm off or, like, yeah. you know, leg at the knee or something like that. So, yeah. Maybe I mean, he'll it just, swipe off her, her inner jaw with it, right? Maybe. Man. And, like, you know, like we saw those humans doing earlier when they were getting that trophy from it, you know? Yeah, that was... Like a callback to that, but he does it to the queen with a big axe. I mean, there's a good chance that anyone listening to this has read the issue. If you haven't, yeah. go read. Go read it. This is a good. This is a really good alien book. This is a really fun alien read. Like we do when we cover the Archie vs. Predator issues, like we're going out of our way to make it clear that this is really, really good comics and yeah. you should be reading them. So. Yes, add it to your pull list and yeah. then read it along with us when the next issue comes out. That's right. It's it's good stuff. Uh, I think I'm good. Are you good? I don't think I have anything else. So yeah, I think I'm I think okay. I'm good too. Do you need a moment to think of your designation? Um yes. Um okay, I think I'm good. All right. Well, this has been Crew Expendable. We will be talking Aliens Fire and Stone next episode. Until then, I've been discarded shoe collector Hallstrom. And I've been Portcullis Closer Rohrbacher. And we are just uh, a couple of hardy adventurers trudging our way through the waters of the Alien franchise. And until next time, stay frosty. Stay frosty. Stay frosty.